This is a conversation with Devon Woodland, president of the National Farmers Organization. The John Connolly Benefit Concert on June 2nd at Omaha is for a legal defense fund for family farmers, Devon. Why is such a fund necessary? Well, Phil, I think that it's um, illegal and certainly immoral. When a creditor goes out onto a farmer's uh, farm and loads up his livestock and his machinery, without that individual being uh, protected through the due process of law. I think that he's entitled to um, know what his rights are, and in too many cases he doesn't know and he doesn't have the resources to pursue uh, any course that would protect his, uh, his own interests. Yeah, the constitutional guarantee that a person may not be deprived of life, liberty, or property That's right, without Phil. due process of law. And this defense fund is to get him the due process. That's right. Now, the farm organizations were organized around a specific purpose. For example, uh, the NFO, what's its purpose? Well, I think that we have to be careful that we don't cloud our priority. And our priority, of course, is collective bargaining. We do have uh, uh, that as the top priority. Other organizations have theirs. Uh, available services now uh, may be counseling, it may be financial advice, there are stress seminars being held, but nowhere is that uh, legal assistance provided for farmers. Now this will be structured after the Environmental Defense Fund and uh, the National uh, Resource Defense Council, which provide a service for uh, the public. And those are established in and they've done a good job. Yes, they have. In getting rights that are already in the law. I see a parallel there. Uh, in fact, the laws aren't bad for farmers. It's getting them administered properly, isn't it? Well, too often, uh, farmers don't have the resources to pursue yeah, right. litigation that may run into uh, an extended period of time. And this fund will be administered by several farm organizations, won't it? Yes, there has been a board established now. We have incorporated uh, the incorporating uh, principles has been the uh, National Farmers Union, the National Farmers Organization, and women involved in farm economics. And there will be two other board members selected at random, yet to be determined, giving us a board of five uh, different uh, areas of representation. Some Missouri farmers who attended the big crisis action rally at Ames went back home and started putting together the Show Me Project where first the dairy farmers got together in groups for collectively selling their milk. Jack Cruz on the road at Ava in southwest Missouri interviews Roger Slotick, coordinator of the Show Me Project. Uh, what we're doing in the state is putting together uh, 276 million pounds of milk, 200,000 head of hogs, about 300,000 head of cattle, and about 65, 000, uh, 65 million bushel of grain. And the, the way the program works is this. We go into an area we have extremely good media coverage, go in and hold a bunch of meetings, uh, introduce the project to the people, get writers, and start working township by township in every county. Along with just putting the production together, we're also building structures out here. We're activating dairy committees, electing dairy committees. We've had meetings like that this week, the second series of meetings where we've got milk put together in the county, going in, activating dairy committees. We were already into the first phase of bargaining down here for that block of for that block of milk, and that will continue right through the other commodities. Is the trigger levels that you've established uh, that you uh, you must have certain amounts of milk or certain number of hogs or certain number of million bushels of grain before you activate the contract? Has this worked well for you? Oh, very well. Well, you can bring on two or three or four hundred dairy producers at one time. The unity thing, the fact that I'm going with my neighbor and we can see some success as this block grows. Uh, psychologically, is very it works very well down here. Uh, what's your production so far? Well, we've been in here about uh, this is about the third week that we've we've had any crew in here at all, and we like I said we're going after 276 million pounds and we're sitting somewhere at 100 or maybe a little bit better. 100 million pounds in three weeks. Negotiations were started yesterday uh, by the dairy committee and by uh, the dairy department that we've got two possibilities that are very interested in the milk locally. Uh, situation being down here that we probably won't even have to use a pump over system. We can go direct into the into the processes, which is a heck of a benefit for the producers. About 85 to 90 percent of the people that we're signing up here are not NFO members, have never been members. 
and they are taking a hold of this thing, and they are out ahead of us. They're riding with us. They're putting on meetings. Words coming from southwest Missouri, loud and clear. Uh, you better attack it with renewed vigor, because they're on the way up. Jack Cruz, Mava, Missouri. Here's Tim Annis, Director of Operations for the Grain Department of the National Farmers Organization. Tim, I understand that for quite a number of months now, American grain producers have been holding on to their production because they don't like the level of the market. Is there anything the grain producers themselves can do to get the market price started upward? Yes, there is something they can do, Phil. They can begin selling their grain, a part of their grain, in a collective selling action. A part of it. Uh, this, this 2020 plan, that schedules it into five divisions, doesn't it? Yes, our 2020 program asks each producer to sell his grain in at least five parts of 20% each. He can, he can divide it into more parts, but at least five times each crop he should sell. Let's talk about the psychology of the grain producer in that very first of the five parts. He says to himself, well, it's too low. I don't want to sell. You're saying sell some of it, huh? Yes, it's very hard for the producer to bite the bullet because he doesn't like current price levels. They're not at good levels, and it, it's tough for him to go against this natural resistance to selling, but he, he must get that selling action going if he's to uh, get the prices improving. Why would that selling that first part at a price he doesn't like get it started? Because a selling action will create a market reaction. The it, traders will bid the market up if they know that they will be rewarded with some additional supplies each time the market goes up. And so the, the selling action itself uh, puts the farmers in a better bargaining position for the balance of their grain, for the rest of their grain, the unsold supplies especially if the grain trade knows that they're in a programmed situation which they understand, huh? Exactly. This is the design of the program, and this is why it will work with enough producers working together. It, it counters all the natural tendencies of producers when they go alone in the marketplace. So you're saying start the process by selling some of it. We're saying that it is a pump priming process and that they do have to bite the bullet, not on all of their grain supplies, you understand. It has to be on a portion of the grain supplies so they have the balance back to capture the advantage we get by creating a stair-stepping improvement of the prices. That was Tim Annis, director of NFO Grain Operations. His message to grain farmers is to demonstrate clearly to the trade that they're selling in regularly programmed stages of selling together under negotiated bargaining contracts. We'd like to have you meet Gary Green, an NFO member who, with another full-time hog specialist, farrows about 3,000 hogs a year in a confinement operation near Farmington, Illinois. They have also two part-time helpers. Gary Green grew up on an Illinois farm where his father operated a 1,200-a-year hog setup. Let's join the conversation where Gary had just told me that he markets between 65 to 70 percent through NFO forward contracts. There's two big advantage points I see in contracting. One of them is that you guarantee a cash flow right. to yourself. And the big problem that most producers have with contracting that I see in, uh, is that most of them don't know where to begin at. And you need to know your cost of production in your livestock or and even the grain before you do your country. You need to know where your cost is at so you can begin to use that cost as your floor in your pricing and then work upwards from that. You mentioned to me that forward contracting has an advantage in cash flow. Explain that, could you? Okay, in, in cash flow, is like I said, we try and contract uh, between 65 to 10 percent of our hogs uh, forward. And this way we know that we have a certain amount of of guaranteed income coming in on a monthly basis. We, uh, we raise hogs and farrow them every, every week, so we have some hogs that are born every week. So we have a monthly flow of hogs, and we guarantee our, our, some of our basic costs is going to be returned. This is, helps us to 
to keep a, a good cash flow coming in. At, we know we're going to get our basic costs covered. And then the other thing that we, if we have something that comes up unexpected for some reason or other, or we want to do some expansion remodeling, these contracts have another great plus to them. And that is that we can take them to the bank and they can be mortgaged by your banker. Uh, all he has to do is sign up and we can just call in to the whole department, read them the contract numbers, the dollar amount and the weights and everything. And they record this, and if you want to, you can let the check be written both to you and the lender. Uh, and most lenders, at least in my area now that they've got familiar with, will own up to 90% of the value of the contract. Gary Green, NFO member from near Farmington, Illinois. He markets mostly through NFO forward contracts. Since he began in 1979, he has done well enough now that he has plans to buy out the interest of Continental Illinois Bank, who financed him. We present Roger Blobaum, Director of Public Relations for the National Farmers Organization. The governors of three Midwest states took decisive action in mid-May with a ban on Canadian hog imports. They said a potential health emergency existed because Canada allows use of chloramphenicol in treating hog diseases. U.S. producers are not allowed to use it. The import ban was applauded by most hog producers, especially those in the upper Midwest, where Canadian hogs have been pouring into packing plants. Reports indicate Canadian live hogs and fresh and frozen pork would add up to nearly 5% of this year's commercial kill. Imports at that level cost U.S. producers about $5 a hundred. The U.S. government, in a dragged-out proceeding, held recently that the imported hogs are government-subsidized. The Canadians say the governors have no right to interfere in trade matters, and some federal officials are deploring the state action. Hog producers, on the other hand, could never understand why nothing was done when their income was being taken away by subsidized imports, or why the government didn't require imported pork to meet the same high standards U.S. producers must meet. The governors did what foot-dragging federal officials have failed to do, they showed leadership in dealing with an extremely unfair situation. It may not look good to the State Department, but from the viewpoint of most hog producers, it was right and it was overdue. Roger Blobaum, Director of Public Relations for NFO. This has been your county informational tape for NFO meetings in the month of June. Compiled and edited by Don Mack, Director of the Broadcast Division. I'm Phil Allen. And that, for this month, is something to think about.